Well, good morning, everyone. I think it's time to start. My name is Dr. Kaisa holberg Du, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at the Nordic Africa Institute in Uppsala, Sweden. Um, we have brought you all together here today for a round table where we will be discussing um, mapping data collection on African higher education. Uh, we were hoping to bring you all together in person um, and were in the early stages of planning a, a conference and then we had this um, virus hit upon us and we had to rethink. So we're trying to do the best in a difficult situation and I'm so glad and grateful that so many of you uh, are able to be with us this morning. Uh, we have a very uh, great lineup. Uh, of uh, organizations and people who will tell us about the work they are doing within this field of data collection on higher education. Um, I just wanted to contextualize a little bit our interest. Um, I'm working together with Professor Lisa Laxo, who is also part of this meeting, on a project mapping the discipline of political science uh, on the continent. And within this work, um, and we're also assisted by uh, Michael. Igbokwe, who is also with us. Um, we realize that it's very difficult to get um, current comparable data on, for instance, um, basic things like how many students study political science in a country, or how many professors are there in political science in West Africa. Um, so from that starting point where we are looking for um, certain things to see, can we say there are trends, can we um, see how this might impact on democratization in a particular country, how many people you train within social sciences. Uh, we, we thought there was a need to, uh, to see what you are all doing and, and how we can uh, work on this um, wicked problem together. Uh, before we uh, start the presentations where you all will have 10 minutes from each organization to let us know uh, the work you do, um, I wanted to um, just go through the uh, kind of rules of engagement when we're meeting on Zoom. I'll put up a slide. Um, and we ask that you keep your microphone on mute when you're not speaking. And if you wish to speak, you can write your name in the chat box. Have you all seen the chat box? And if you have any um, issues, uh, you can contact my, my colleague Camilla Letma, who's sitting here uh, opposite to me. Um, and we're also recording this meeting and it will be uh, divided into snippets and shared by the Association of African Universities, who are also our um, um, partner for this, this meeting. Um, you can choose active speaker view if you want to see the person who is speaking a bit bigger, or you can choose a gallery view so you can see everybody that is part. But I think it's also important to say that don't be shy to turn off your video um, as we go through presentations. If you want to walk around or stretch, it can be important uh, to, to be able to do that while we meet. Uh, to start us off, I want to uh, invite our director here at NAI, um, Therese Schumander Magnusson, to give a few words of welcome. Therese, over to you. Thank you, Kaisa. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so good to see so prominent researchers from all around the world gathering to discuss this mapping exercise of higher education. My name is Therese Kromande Magnusson. I, I started as a director for the Nordic Africa Institute in October last year, and quite early, beginning of this year, uh, Kaisa and a couple of colleagues approached me to discuss um, can we have a new approach uh, in how we support uh, and promote knowledge generation on higher education and I'm very supportive to that. To that. Um, I, I'm very encouraged to see the growing interest uh, of the relevance of higher education. The young people in Africa deserves uh, equal and qualitative access to higher education on the continent. And we can continue together to, to enable them to access that. But there are a lot of issues uh, in order to do that even better. And one is of course the mapping discussion that you will be having today, which I will follow 
uh, in a very excited way and really looking forward to see where you see the trends and the developments and the lack uh, of data and what needs to be done. Uh, NIE will continue to be a partner to you in all of this. Uh, and I'm very encouraged uh, that, Kaisa, you will take the lead in the discussion to see how we can actually draw some conclusions by the end of the day and how we can select and prioritize between ourselves in moving this agenda forward with all of our stakeholders and target groups. And I'd also like to thank AAU for uh, co-convening this session together with us. So with that, uh, good luck, and uh, I look forward to fruitful discussions. Kaisa? Thank you so much, Therese, for welcoming all of us. Um, we are, I think, too many for, for everybody to introduce themselves, but we have um, quite a large number of researchers with us from the Nordic Africa Institute, and then uh, our guests you will hear from uh, in time. I think you can share, share the program. This slide. Uh, so we will be starting with the uh, AAU, our partner, uh, and then we will move on to uh, Francois von Schattbrück, uh, who is with Stellenbosch University um, and was formerly a researcher with, with the Center for Higher Education Trust. Then we will hear from Education Sub-Saharan Africa. Lucy and Jennifer are with us. And then we'll hear from the Human Sciences Research Council in South Africa. Uh, we'll hear from Sanward. Um, and I'm not sure if we will hear from UNESCO. They had some, some issues with their uh, participation. Uh, we will see when we get there if they are able to join us. Um, but I think we will just get into the program right away. And I would like to invite Nudom Mudlamini, uh, who is the Director of uh, ICT and Knowledge Management um, at the Association of African Universities uh, to start, start us off this morning. Nudomo, are you there? Yes, yes, I am. I hope you can all hear me. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, I won't be sharing any slides. Uh, I'll speak to this uh, presentation. I hope that's okay. That's more than okay. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Um, I, I think we all know that there are challenges in Africa pertaining to data and statistics. And African countries are participating in programs such as the African Science, Technology and Innovation Indicators Program, which is called ASTI but uh, it is still yet to be institutionalized in most of the countries. So there are variations in the quality of data from African countries. And uh, it seems that data and statistic activities have not been prioritized in national budgets. Therefore, there are no robust systems uh, for data repositories there are initiatives in different African countries, but they, there's more that can be done. And there's a, a serious issue also around a critical mass of experts in the area of data and statistics to support uh, the national level initiatives. And also uh, we are seeing that it's important not to just uh, do once off uh, initiatives, but to really ground uh, some of these uh, initiatives. And continentally, as Africa, we seem to be still relying on U UIS data, uh, which is the United Nations uh, initiative. Uh, but there are challenges also with, with that. So we see a lot of fragmentation and uh, we also see a lot of issues around uh, resource uh, issues. Um, concerning uh, the, the data on, 
on uh, education, we as the AAU uh, seem to be well positioned to sort of initiate and also move the process forward. And in the past, we have collaborated with the International Association of Universities uh, to produce a, a compendium for data which sort of maps out what is happening in the higher education sector. And we have also recently partnered with ESA. I'm glad to see they are in the meeting as well to pilot some initiatives towards uh, linking uh, policy initiatives to evidence. And then uh, we, uh, as, uh, as an institution also, we do a number of surveys, normally looking at uh, the member institutions to find out how they are doing certain things. But uh, I, I, I think uh, we also need to make sure that what we do is sort of uh, adopted at an institutional level and is also linked to what is happening at a national level. So even though the data we are looking for comes from institutions, we need to make sure that those institutions have the infrastructure and have the capacity to feed data uh, upwards. There's also a need to ensure that uh, the templates and the fields that are being captured are discussed so that there's no duplication of data collection. Currently, we find that because there's no harmonization of some of these tools, different institutions will ask for the same data from the same institutions many times and universities, for example, have told us that uh, this sort of makes it very difficult for them when different institutions come to them asking for the same data. So we are working towards uh, developing a management information system in collaboration with the national, uh, uh, like the national councils for education in Africa, so that uh, when they request data from universities, they request it in a manner that we can also use it, so that we are all fitting into the same sort of template the same system um, I, I know this is a, a, a huge uh, in initiative but we are piloting it with a, a few of the national councils for higher education just to understand what data do they collect how do they collect it and how can we have a a continental platform where everybody can uh, um, access that uh, data. So we also get a lot of requests for data. We get asked about data, just as Kaiser said, people want to know what's the best uh, computer science program in Africa, what are the top five, uh, schools of engineering that I can go to, what's the contribution of universities in terms of uh, uh, economic development. You know, they, they also ask us about uh, numbers, the impact, uh, entrepreneurship, they ask us about uh, graduates in Africa, where do they go? It's sort of all sorts. And we 
really three feel remaining. Yes, we we really feel the need to solve this issue and ensure that there's a strong partnership and consistent efforts towards uh, addressing the issues around data and, and, and statistics. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, um, Nodomo, for, for starting us off. Um, I think you touched upon several very important um, aspects of this, uh, not the least, which I did not mention, what happens to, to graduates as they uh, educated uh, into um, gainful employment or what happens to them after going through a program. So I think that's an important aspect of, of data as well as impact and quality. Um, if anyone has a question for, for Nodomo, maybe you write your name in the chat or let us know that you want to, to speak. We can take one or two questions before we uh, move into the next presentation by Francois. Let, let me start off. Um, I was interested in the continental platform you spoke about. Does it have a name and what countries are you piloting it? Um, it doesn't yet have a name, but we are piloting it uh, in, in Ghana here with the National Council for Tertiary Education. We, have, we are having conversations with the specific universities in Ghana and the National Statistics Office and understanding their templates that the templates that are used by universities to give data to the National Council for Tertiary Education and also understanding how the National Council for Tertiary Education passes on the data to the National Statistics Office and also trying to identify the gaps, the duplications, the aspects that the universities are maybe not reporting on or not tracking through their systems, which maybe they can easily track so that the university systems also uh, match the needs of the data at a national level and at a regional level. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's, that's helpful. If there are no questions for Nudum at this point, I think we'll launch into uh, the next presentation. Uh, it's by Francois van Skalkweg, um, and he's coming to us from Stellenbosch University. Um, Francois, do you have a PowerPoint or you will speak to us? Yeah, I'm going to try and share it. So let's see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for being with us this morning. Let's see what I'm going to share. Francois has written um, a chapter in a book that, where he refers to 007 in the opening paragraph. So I'm, I'm very excited about his presentation and have high hopes. Can you see the, my screen? Can you, you see your screen? Yes. Can you share it once again if you want to have it? Just click new share and share it one more time if you want to have it in the, in the big screen mode. Because um, now we're seeing all the slides. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, just click new share and share it again. Okay, I'm sharing it again. Can you see it now? We see the PowerPoint, but not in the yeah, big I'm, screen mode. I understand. I'm trying to get it to go into presentation. Yes. There. That is that is better? Yes. And can we okay. also help us by letting you know when you have three minutes left? Yeah. Thanks, because all I can see now is PowerPoint. I can't see any, <laughs> anything, anything Zoom related. Okay, so opportunity, I really appreciate it. And I think this is a long overdue uh, discussion. I mean, even just listening to the first presentation, I have a million questions and ideas. Um, so I think this is a really valuable uh, first step. I hope there'll be, there'll, there'll be more in the, in the future. What I'm going to present today is a, is a project that's completed. So it might be a little bit different from what everyone else is, is doing. But it was a project that was called the Higher Education Research and Advocacy Network in Africa project. Uh, we just call it 
because you can't work in this field without having an acronym. So that's our, our acronym that's, that's stuck. Um, the project uh, lasted for 10 years from 2008 to 2017. And I think in that in itself is, is important to acknowledge. It was a fairly long uh, project, which gave us time to build relationships um, across universities, which I'll talk about a little bit more just now. Um, also, the project took uh, place in three phases, and I think that in itself gave the project an opportunity to rethink at various points in its uh, evolution. So, you know, as it moved from phase one to phase two, it was looking for more funding and had to re-articulate what it was trying to do. And that gave it a chance to focus and, and sometimes change its, uh, its focus to, to some extent. There were multiple funders of, of the project. Uh, Kresge and Ford were, were funders, but Carnegie Corporation was the, the consistent funder through all three, all three of the phases. It was a network, as the name implies. So it wasn't just about the universities, but there were academics from around the globe that participated in the network and attended meetings and, and gave their particular insights. Um, and there were over 100 uh, publications that, from Chet's point of view at least, uh, the organization that uh, hosted the project, important part of the advocacy uh, component of the, uh, of the project. Um, there were, as I said, eight universities in eight African countries. Um, I can show you on the next slide. This is the network. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. It's not that, uh, that visible either. Um, but here are the eight universities that, that participated. So University of Ghana, Makerere University, Nairobi, uh, Dar es Salaam, Mauritius, Eduardo Mondlane in Mozambique, uh, University of Botswana, University of Cape Town. <clears throat> Initially, these were chosen as flagship universities. That was the term that was used. Later, that terminology was shifted towards research-orientated universities. So these were the main research universities in their respective countries. Of course, there are others, and we couldn't include everyone. Um, as you always know, there are always restrictions in terms of uh, budget, time, resourcing. Um, and so these were the ones that, that participated in across all three phases. Maybe as a little side note, it was interesting that in the phase one, there was a different university in South Africa called Nelson Mandela University that participated. But at the request of the other African universities, they wanted the University of Cape Town to participate because they wanted the best university at that stage, at least in South Africa, so they could compare themselves not to what was seen as a middling university, but as the top university in the, in the country. That caused its own problems, by the way, when it came to data and comparisons later on, but that's um, not so important for today. So the project obviously had its analytical framework. I'm not gonna go into this in too much detail. Um, but it does provide some background, which I think is important in terms of understanding what data we collected and for what purpose. So the, the project started off being interested in the relationship between higher education and development. It wasn't just for the sake of collecting data. We wanted to understand how higher education was contributing to development in these particular countries by working with these uh, uh, universities. The earlier phases looked at, uh, worked with the higher education councils, worked with uh, governments to understand the broader ecosystem. But as the project progressed, as I said, the focus shifted more towards the universities. And so we focused in phase three, for example, only on the universities. Um, we're particularly interested in their, in their contribution to development. And that in this project was uh, operationalized as their knowledge production. So we were particularly interested in the knowledge aspect of, of universities. And we, that was uh, conceptualized as, uh, uh, being the academic core of these universities this is a term borrowed from uh, Burton Clark. And to do that, of course, we needed to know how the universities were performing. We couldn't just have this notion of an academic core and a strong or a weak core, but we needed to be able to measure and understand uh, in quantitative terms what, what that meant. And so we needed to develop, um, I'm gonna skip that slide. We had to develop a set of uh, indicators so that was the st step one. We had to know well, what, if we, if we want to understand what the academic core is, what, what do we need to measure? So that required several meetings to agree on what those indicators are. It wasn't that the projects came up and imposed a set of indicators. It was in consultation with the, the eight universities that these indicators were agreed upon. Equally important were targets. It wasn't sufficient just to say, well, the indicator is a number of uh, doctoral graduates in a but what should the universities be aspiring to if they want to call themselves research-orientated universities, if they want to be 
framed as research universities, well, then of course it matters how many doctorate uh, students you produce. If you're just producing undergraduate students, you may be fulfilling a different function, not a lesser function, but a different function. So if we talk about labor market absorption or something along those lines, then those universities may have important roles to play, but because we were interested in knowledge production specifically, the indicators and targets were related to knowledge production. We then needed to move on to collecting the data over the three phases. Um, this was uh, probably the most challenging part of the, the project. Um, we had to reach consensus on definitions. Um, it was mentioned in the previous presentation how even within Ghana, um, there's challenges in this regard. Remember now we're working across systems. So it's not just within one country, but across eight different countries. So when um, the project talked about full-time FTEs, full-time equivalents, what does that mean? What does that mean in Ghana versus in uh, uh, Tanzania, for example? It might mean different things. So there had to be a lot of discussions about what FTE means across all of the uh, in indicators. Also issues around qualifications. Um, you know, we aggregated the data to um, high levels of, say, fields of study. So if we're talking about STE, um, science, technology, engineering, well, which courses and which qualifications are counted towards that category and not towards um, another category? So there was a lot of discussion about how those are allocated. We also had to talk about reporting minutes, periods. Remaining. Okay. We also had to talk about reporting periods. It's not the same in every country. Um, make year ends different periods than in, in others. So if we say 2015 data, what do we mean? That was important. So standardization was important. We created a data manual um, so that all this consistent, uh, all this standardization was codified. So there was a common reference point for all the universities to use. Um, the data was collected by the universities themselves. It wasn't collected by the research team. Of course, there were site visits and discussions, but the data was collected by them. That was quite important sometimes when the universities complained about the quality of the data. It was often then gone back to them and said, but you provided the data. So if there's a quality problem, then we need to understand where that quality pro problem originated at the university. And we collected data on students, staff, and publications, those three broad categories. Obviously, we were interested in this data being used by the universities. It wasn't just for the sake of it of being collected. We were going to use it for our analytical purposes, but we also wanted the universities to institutionalize data use. And the way we approached this was to have annual meetings in South Africa where the participants would present either a strategic plan in one year or they would reflect on um, where they come. Um, but in all cases, they had to use the data that they'd collected to worry about their, their institution. And that was intended to um, inculcate a sense of data use. We also had in-country Hirana forums, so we traveled around and met um, at the universities, and this was important to bring in a broader group of stakeholders. Um, to give an example, when we met at Smakarere, members of council were there, and members of council would complain and say, we never see data. Why don't we see this data? We didn't even know it existed. We want to know about the performance of our institution. We, we're in the dark. So that was an important uh, opportunity to broaden uh, the reach of the data. And then the last point on quality, we saw this taking place. One minute remaining. Sorry, how many minutes? One. One, okay. Um, through open data use, I mean through use. So the more you use the data, the more you find that the mistakes in the data. Uh, we had issues where we still don't know exactly how many PhDs there were at the University of Ghana in a particular year because the, the registrar, the VC, and the person collecting the data just can't agree on, on what the number is. But that tells us where to focus to improve the quality. And then through open data, making it accessible to other people to use also raises, uh, improves the quality because we find certain uh, errors in the data. So they're the indicators. Don't have time to go through those, but they're all 19 of them and the ratings and the targets. People can come back to these on the slides. I'm not uh, certainly don't have time to go through all of these. This is just to show you the data um, that we collected and the visualizations that emerged from them. Um, Here's the open data where it was accessible and still is. Um, the two of the publications I would recommend if anyone wanted to find out more about the study to read the one on the right hand side, which is the culmination publication from the entire project. Here are some of the successes and the failures. I want to be honest about things that didn't work. Unfortunately, I'm not going to have time to go through those now, but maybe if there's time in the discussions later, people can come back and ask about certain things. Um, well, I, I think that's. This is kind of very important. So maybe you want to, to share it with us this slide. Okay. This okay. Allowing you to. Okay, to thank you for the, <laughs> the extra, the concern. 
Um, so, I mean, I think that the success that we often underestimate in this project when we reflected after 10 years was the standardization process. This is not to be taken for granted. It was a long process. We had to, it was done by consensus and it resulted in, as you can see the little image there in the data manual. This made it possible to collect data across different systems and to do comparative national level, well, institutional level data. And those comparisons are very important, not just from us analytic, from an analytical point of view, but really for the universities themselves that were all self-identifying as research universities that could then compare themselves to their peers and say, how am I doing in terms of publications? How am I doing in terms of uh, graduate outputs, et cetera? So that was a really important, I think, outcome from, them, from this project. And I'm hoping that this forum can feed some of this into other work that's been done, like what's been done at AAU. I mean, it doesn't make sense not to look at the data manual and say, well, at least we can use some of this. Not all of it might work, but why reinvent the wheel? That, that to me seems inefficient um, and, and unethical to some, some extent. And then another success was in the data use. That was limited, but we did see over time that data was being used increasingly in the annual reports, for example, of these universities. So if you took an uh, annual report from 2008 and compared it to an annual report from 2017, you see a quite a strong shift in terms of um, I say data, you say quantification of some of the strategic plans and objectives that, that, that were in that annual report. Um, and I think that was a, an important indicator of, of data use. I'll say there are pockets of capacity. I mean, in a project like this, we always work with a few people at the institution. So we can't pretend that everyone is capacitated, but at least after 10 years, there were people that had data skills that they certainly didn't have when they started. Um, it provided an empirical overview of the university performance over time. And I think that was important. So you had 10 years of data to look at performance versus aspirations. We know universities and governments in Africa are quite big on aspirations. We like to have you know, plans for 2060. So, you know, how do we actually quantify those and are they realistic? I think that was a quite important outcome. The failure was trying to centralize data collection on a single online platform. We actually developed a platform of that nature where universities could collect uh, and submit the data. Um, it didn't work partly because the project, the person in the project um, struggled with the technical requirements. Um, and universities didn't really have an incentive to, to collect the data in that way. And that's something I really want to emphasize is the incentives. Um, yes, there are budget constraints, skills constraints, all these things, but there are very low incentives in Africa for anyone to collect data. One way to do that is through use. If they see value through use, that becomes an incentive, but there aren't any hard or built-in incentives. In South Africa, we're fairly lucky. If you don't submit the data, you don't get your money. It's, it's that simple. So. Everyone has a data officer at the university that has to collect the data and submit on a regular basis to this particular system. But that doesn't exist yet in all African countries. It, it may be starting, but it's not there. Um, so that's the challenge that I've just mentioned. Um, and then data sharing and access. As I said, at, the, at one of the forums we had, we still didn't see a lot of sharing beyond the project. So we don't see the, the, the data but the participants from the institutional level talking to the National Council necessarily and saying, here's data, are you aware of it? This is, this is quite useful. As I said, the project is over, but there is ARUA, and I don't know how many of you are aware of uh, ARUA, which is the African Research Universities Alliance. Mm -hmm. It's an alliance of several universities across Africa, and they're going through a similar data collection process at the moment. So it might be useful to invite them to participate. In they, they were invited, actually. Okay, okay. okay. yeah, so maybe a bit busy or... Um, and I think it's quite early days for them too. Um, they're facing a lot of the challenges that we had. Some of the Hirana universities are participating or are members of ARUA, but not all. So there's some uh, sort of uneven playing fields. Okay, there. thank you, Francois. There are some questions okay. for you. So I wanted to, to um, no, no, no. allow participants to also um, ask them. So Lucy is first and then it's Jörgen. Okay. Just unmuting myself. So I had a question about um, example of data use, but I think I asked that question before you then actually very <laughs> went through on your last slide some examples of data use. Um, so I'm going to sneak in an, an extra question, yeah. which is um, you talk about incentives for collecting this information and that being very driven by kind of government process. I'm wondering mm -hmm. what incentives there are from consumers, so students and their parents demanding more information. Yeah, I think that's that's a good incentive to to build in. 
it, it links to what data you collect then. And I mean, that, that's important. So maybe our focus on research was um, not, wouldn't have been as, as interesting to a parent or, or a student yeah. as maybe labor absorption data. You know, if I get this degree, I get that job, for example. So I think it's, it's important to know at the beginning what you're trying to achieve and then those incentives become a little bit clearer. Our focus is relatively narrow. I mean, and, and still it was quite a big challenge and undertaking. Um, I mean, in our country, we, we don't really have good labor market absorption data. It's still something that's missing. It was collected at, at one point and then it stopped. Um, and so we see ad hoc surveys that, that get done, but they don't tell us over time um, what happens. And I think that links to your point about incentives. If the incentives are good, you can start to institutionalize the collection and use of data. When they're weak, we have what we see in Africa a lot, and this happens in Ghana and other countries that have surveys. You know, you have a census. Once a year, we go and ask the universities, well, if it's once a year, maybe every four years. So I think we need to move away from that kind of data collection to regular in institutionalized uh, data collection so we can get a real-time picture of, of, of what's happening over time. Thank you. Okay. So Jurgen, next. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting presentation. Um, I'm an economist, so I was kind of wondering about, you talked about performance. Mm. Did you try to measure some kind of productivity? I mean, you relate some outputs to uh, the amount of resources, and then you compare across countries or universities. Or... Yeah. So we did have some productivity indicators. Um, I mean, not many. Um, many. Some of them were just output indicators, which just looked at raw outputs. But we did look on sort of on the publications, for example, and on the doctoral supervision. We would look at capacity available versus outputs, and how much capacity would still be available. Um, and this was very important because the universities varied a lot in size, of course. So University of Mauritius and Botswana versus University of Ghana and Nairobi are completely different uh, beasts. So to say that Nairobi only produce, or produces you know, 10,000 master's graduates and, and Mauritius only 100, that doesn't tell you anything until you start to look at well, what the capacity is to, super, to produce those masters. So we did, in the indicators, bring in those, uh, that, that aspect. But we didn't have a strong efficiency productivity focus. I mean, the productivity was really directed towards what capacity is there to increase research. Um, if you're aspiring to be a research university, and only 20% of your staff have a doctoral degree, well then what is your capacity to supervise doctoral students? It's fairly limited. So the conditionalities I think were important and maybe that's the answer to your question. We've started to get to conditionalities, but there's certainly more work we could have done there. Are you happy with that, Jürgen? Yes. Yes, then I will invite Esther to um, take the stage. Uh, thank you, François. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we are lucky to have two representatives of uh, education of Saharan Africa with us. Uh, Lucy Heddy is the Knowledge and Research Director and Jennifer Ude is the Program Manager. So welcome and let us hear from Esa. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kaiser, um, for inviting us and also AAU um, for hosting the, this seminar today. Um, so I'm going to give a quick overview of about ESSA and what we do, and then Jennifer's going to go into a bit more detail on um, one of our mo most data-heavy projects. So ESSA stands for Education Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, our focus is on tertiary education, as in Sub-Saharan Africa, as it faces um, the enormous challenge of preparing young Africans um, for work. So this, the challenge to the tertiary sector, it, as we see it, is it, it needs to expand massively, but at the same time, it needs to become more inclusive. But it also needs to increase quality and it needs to do this fast. Um, and so ESSA's mission is to ensure that those people who are um, driving this incredible transformation of tertiary education in Sub-Saharan Africa have access to the right data, the right evidence, and the right networks in order to make effective decisions. And so that's recognizing that while evidence is really important, acting on that evidence and bringing about behavior change is um, a social phenomenon. 
and requires networks and people uh, to make that happen. So we've historically worked in three, um, in three focus areas. So one has been around scholarships um, and we've mapped the top 350 providers of scholarships to young people from sub-Saharan Africa. And on the basis of that, we have written the chapter in this year's Global Education Monitoring Report, reporting um, on SDG 4B. Um, and we are looking to work with a coalition of scholarship providers to do more to improve um, the information that's collected about scholarships, to do more to understand their impact, share that information and have a better focus on um, changing the lives of young Africans. Um, we've also done a lot of work, and Jennifer will go more into this on the moment, in a moment, around the faculty crisis in sub-Saharan Africa. So this is recognising that there's a huge gap between the amount of faculty that there are and that are being trained and the amount of faculty that will be needed to um, meet demand in the continent in the coming years. And, and then we've also focused on raising the profile of African ac academics in the field of education. Um, and our major work here is partnership with Cambridge University, building up what we call the African Education Research Database. And this is a database of all education research done by anyone with an affiliation to an African university. And so that's about both raising the profile of research, but also researchers and creating a better community of education researchers on the continent. We're also kicking off a couple of new focus areas. So one is around um, female leadership in education, um, in tertiary education. And the other is that focus on um, transition from tertiary education into employment. I'm trying to understand better while it's very much recognised the important role that the private sector should be playing in terms of curriculum development um, and offering of internships and bridging that gap. That's recognised at a policy level, but it's really not happening. And why is that? How can these policies be better operationalised? And with that, I will hand over to Jennifer. Hi, thanks, Lucy. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to try and share my screen. Perfect. So this is um, one of the projects that um, Lucy mentioned and also Ndum I mentioned earlier because this is the project we did in collaboration with um, AAU and also um, the Population Reference Bureau. So it's about looking at the demographics of African faculty. Um, and really just a bit of background on this project. It was really brought out of a need, uh, realisation that um, in order to um, provide quality tertiary education, we have to have sufficient supply of qualified faculty and teaching staff. So it was um, in consideration that the, there's growing enrollment in many um, African universities. Answering the question, are there enough faculty to satisfy this, this growing enrollment um, within the universities as well? We partnered, so ESSA, we work in partnership with um, both Africans and, and experts um, from, from around the world. So this, this project brought together demographic experts um, in the Population Reference Bureau. Um, AAU um, were one of our leading partners as well in this. Um, and they really brought the network, the stakeholders, um, and access to institutions such as the National Council of Tertiary Education, where a lot of our data came from as well. Do quite hey, then. Sorry to interrupt. Your your slides aren't moving. Oh, I don't know if you need to reshare the screen, but we're still stuck on the first. Can you, you press the new share after you put it up in the show mode? I'm sorry. What am I supposed to press second? So second first, if you have the PowerPoint on your own desktop, as you want to show it to us, and then you just press new share in Zoom to show to share it again. Okay. So you need to share it after you've uh, set it up exactly how you want it, or it will stu get stuck on one page. Okay, so. Now we, I can also see you have the protected view, so maybe if you could first enable editing in PowerPoint. Ah. 
And then after that, if you go to, um, are you still there? I am still here. Still but I'm able to edit now. I'm going to now share my, try to share my screen again. No, first put up the PowerPoint in the, in the right uh, um, mode for, for showing it. Like, so it takes the, the whole screen. And then after you share it to us. Okay. And then Is it okay? Yes, perfect. Perfect. So I was talking to the, the title slide, is that what you're saying to me? <laughs> um I'll start from here anyway. Um, so, so let me start um, with the partners as well. So we worked in collaboration with AAU, um, with the Population Reference Bureau, who are demographic experts. They were the ones who really um, helped us in defining the methodology that we used um, for this analysis. Um, all our data came from existing data that was being collected by the National Council of Tertiary Education. And ESSA's role in, in this project was really to bring together all the partners. I think the important things are kind of who we worked for, so who we worked with, so uh, and where our data came from and what the methodology that we used as well. So it was a demographics of faculty analysis. There are three main components to the methodology. One was the understanding of the Ghanaian policy context. So these were the constraints um, that our analysis was, was put through. So we, um, via the National Council of Tertiary Education, we were able to get some data and information around the policy norms around faculty and that's from the Ghanaian government as well. Most all, almost all of our data that we um, used in this project was existing data that was already being collected remaining. by the National Council of Tertiary Education. So that was a slight limitation to this project, but it allowed us to at least demonstrate what can be done with, with existing data. Mm -hmm. We also worked very closely by Hold meetings and interviews with the institutions themselves to verify the data to give us some feedback on the methodology as well. And, and as we started to collect data to see if what we were saying resonated with, with some of the data analysis that they were already doing in their institutions as well. Maybe talking about some of the challenges that we faced in, in the project, it was really a, around the availability of data. So we, we were very, very light. We did this project in a period of about six months. Um, we were very reliant on the data that was already being collected by um, NCTE. There was a lot of variability in reporting across the institutions as well. So there was a lot of cleaning required for the data as well. Um, and we weren't able to make full use of, of the disaggregated raw data available um, in, in the time as well. So lots of inconsistencies um, in the data that, that was available for the project. Um, because I'm not sharing my slides, I can't can't share the stuff, can't share the findings with you. Um, but really, we were able to answer the question: Are there enough faculty to provide projections on the current situation, um, which which is a bit dated now, but also look looked ahead to 2025 um, and make quite high level um, predictions into what numbers of faculty that institutions are going to need um, to cater for this growing enrollment rate as well. And this project is really an example of how we can use evidence and data to inform policy. Um, I think with, with the Ghana example, the Ghana pilot, we were able to answer the question to demonstrate that this methodology worked and we were able to gather the evidence and to start to talk about policy, but we didn't actually go as far as um, developing policy recommendations in this first pilot phase. And um, what we want to do in the second phase is focus heavily on how this evidence can be used um, to inform policy and, and to take action. And we're working with AAU again, um, but it'll take it to a different region. So we're, we're also um, including additional partners in the Inter-University Council of East Africa and we're working with them and their member institutions to refine the methodology that we have and do a similar analysis 
um, in East Africa um, with the main objective of um, informing um, policy around faculty in East Africa. And we're quite, quite well placed to do that in, in East Africa through the partnership with IUCEA, um, as a lot of their members are actually um, governments and permanent secretaries of the, very, of the six member states that are, that are underneath their umbrella as well. I think okay. I probably stop there and maybe take questions and I can dig into anything that I haven't um, covered or any particular interest. Thank, thank you so much, Lucy and Jennifer. Sorry for the issues with technology. This is our new normal. So okay. uh, every now and then there will be issues like that. If you want to share the slides, you can email them to me and I can share them with Francois. Oh, I can do that. And maybe also um, to say that Francois, you are also talking about your reports that are available, um, open access. Uh, I think you talked about the research universities and also data manuals. So if you want to um, maybe share the links with me, I can also share them with, with everyone. Those are the great, useful uh, publications. Um, I have not seen any names in the chat with questions for for Essa. Um, but, but I, I think from your presentation, you're kind of echoing uh, Francois' yes. um, discussion around incentives for reporting data and, and finding ways of, of um, finding comparable data, that those are our main issues. Um, so, so it's like we're seeing a converging, but, but I think what, what is so uh, unique about your project is also focusing on, on the, what you call faculty crisis, and I think that's mm. one of the areas where um, Lisa and I and Michael have seen a, a big lack of data, just basic data on, on the number of uh, faculty uh, at different universities. So I think it's uh, exciting to, to hear that you're planning to expand the project. And, and maybe just to add as well with uh, um, IUC, I mean, it's kind of in its early phase as well, but we want to, um, we're kind of working on this challenge of use of data as well with, with IUCA and, and IUCA are also looking at a, a higher education information management system for the region and so we're, we already see very strong links between the analysis that we're doing just on faculty and this um, the data that they're going to be collecting in this higher education um, management system so they're, they're in our team um, we're working quite closely with them to make sure that the two systems or the two bits of work actually talk to each other because it's in linking with um, systems such as the HEMIS that they're doing that we can ensure there's the sustainability in the work that we're doing and that they can that we can demonstrate and ensure that we are designing into the process right from the start. Um, and clearly that is important to find sustainable ways of collecting data because it's the kind of change over time in a way that is, is interesting to, to many of us and I guess to the universities and, and countries themselves to see that there's uh, improvements made. Uh, thank you so much for, for your presentation. I think maybe more questions will kind of come uh, in the sure. discussion as well. I think we'll uh, move on to the Human Sciences Research Council. And here again, we are uh, happy to have two people sharing the 10 minutes. Uh, we have Sharon Hendricks, she's the Executive Director at the Africa Institute of South Africa at the HSRC. And we also have the Executive Director of the Human Sciences Research Council, uh, Heidi Van Royen. So welcome, and I'm giving the word over to the two of you. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity for us to talk to you this morning from the Human Sciences Research Council in South Africa. We come, we come at this topic from a slightly different angle. We are essentially a research uh, organization, of course, interested in data uh, and the ways in which we manage that and we use that to make sense of what we do. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and then Cheryl is going to talk a bit more about uh, um, our work uh, in the region. And hopefully those two pieces uh, make some contribution to this round table. So the HSOC is, um, Yes, our vision, what we hope to do to be uh, to work at this, all of these levels in the production and dissemination of transformative social justice and humanities research with the end goal or the primary outcome of uh, creating a just and equal society. And I think it's something that's developmental focus, something that all of us are interested in. 
we wanted to try and get there in the following ways by conducting basic and uh, applied research uh, that will contribute, particularly in our country, to these pressing problems of uh, alleviation of poverty and a reduction in the inequality gap uh, and the expansion of decent work opportunities for the majority of people of the people in our country. We attempt to do so through three main streams of work, um, um, and four uh, actually, uh, through three. Um, these are work and focus on inclusive economic uh, development, uh, thinking about human and social capabilities and those, how those might impact uh, poverty and inequality. And then a third stream of work on developmental capable and ethical state, um, which is really looking at how we strengthen uh, issues around social cohesion, create safe communities, and build uh, a society and a state that is capable, ethical, and developmental. Um, um, and then, fourthly, our Africa Institute uh, in, uh, in, in South Africa, which uh, Cheryl will talk about in, in a minute, and the extent to which our work tries in, and extend to both the region and, and beyond. I'm going to talk a little bit more about a new kind of focus and perhaps that leads into the discussion today, a new focus that I think many of us are engaging with, many of you in the UK and in Europe are starting to do this work already, thinking about, and in many ways that started this conversation, this focus on data, on the importance of data as a way of managing that, containing that, disseminating and hopefully using that data to create greater use and uptake. So the idea that we collect data, we do research for researchers' sake only, I think we're all challenging that. And realizing if we are wanting to impact these broader impacts in society, a social and just society addressing poverty and inequality, if we're wanting to address these broader uh, uh, impacts, uh, we have to be uh, thinking much more about how does our data, how does our research uh, move through these various pathways from dissemination um, to better communication and, and, and translation of our research findings and hopefully to better uptake. I think we all understand our role as knowledge producers is shifting and it's really about how do we create enabling environments, how do we create spaces where the issues, the topics, the work we do in research and academic environments that has been taken up and is being used is shifting the way uh, societies or publics think about themselves and about our work. So a big focus in our work in the HSRC is, is about moving towards impact and looking at how we much more purposefully and intentionally move our research through this uh, pathways uh, to impact. We bring together three, four streams of work in a program that I head on the Impact Center, looking at issues around science and society, impact assessment, strategic partners and communication, to try and think about how do we move our work much more purposefully and intentionally across this, this pathways to impact uh, pathway. Um, in thinking about that, or in thinking about how we do that, we've had to also think about our data and how, as many of you already are talking about and thinking about, I thought uh, Francois's presentation this morning is a really good example of, of the way in which we, we are all trying to get uh, to that particular kind of level, making our data accessible, uh, whether those are articles, the data and our workings. In our case, uh, we have a big focus on, on curating our data, so making sure that we manage data that becomes the digital knowledge resource, and that if it is a useful digital knowledge resource that exists, others can use it um, and access it. Uh, so a bigger uh, uh, effort and attempt at making our data much more easily accessible, make accessible making those data sets um, uh, organized in a particular way that others can use them. And then really hoping that we can get to this point of one aspect of usage, which is the data, the studies we generate, the knowledge we generate from them. If that is much more easily available, open and accessible, um, we could get people uh, using that and engaging with it, amplifying what's available through our work, informing their work, um, and hopefully expanding the footprint of some of the work and the studies that we do. Um, I can't show you, you can't see all my slides because I don't think I'm moving through it in that way for you, but in the last, in the last while or so, we have about 174 data sets uh, which are currently being, uh, exist on our, our uh, data curation uh, site. That's both quantitative and qualitative, it's available. It's been used in a couple of ways, uh, particularly in the last uh, five, uh, last year, for example about 152 unique users um, uh, have made access to these uh, data sets that I've just mentioned. 
and the use of that data encouragingly is from uh, primarily from uh, 56 percent used for other research projects, 19% of that used uh, for dissertation, 16% of that used in, in teaching, um, um, and 8.7% of that used for policy-related analysis. So the example of our data curation uh, repository is uh, perhaps uh, one such place where we are trying to think about how do we take the data that we gather, how do we make that much more usable, accessible, how do we open that up, how do we encourage use um, how do we encourage others to be thinking about that data to help them inform their next questions? We also increasingly, just lastly, before I hand over to Cheryl, also increasingly thinking about and trying to find ways of making our data much more accessible through these dashboards um, and Francois's work and projects there, those easy to use visuals uh, that allow us to uh, make summaries of our information, summaries of our pro of our uh, projects, for example, we have this big multi-year project that we've done, a lot of that data is not always accessible to the public. So how do we make those much more easier, visually Three appealing, minutes remaining. Uh, uh, available and, and available to others, uh, again, to use? And so I'm going to hand over to you, Cheryl. Thank you. As Heidi indicated, um, we're coming at this slightly differently because we're not necessarily collecting data on uh, higher education institutions um, across Africa, although we work with universities doing collaborative research, et cetera, across the continent. Just to note that uh, I can relate to what you're saying because last year I tried to do a study on uh, which universities were teaching uh, uh, political science, peace and security related courses, um, and what was being taught in those courses, and it was pretty difficult to find that kind of information. On the Africa Institute, it's quite an old institute. I'm really not going to go into its history or its objectives. I think if we're running out of time, um, what I thought may be more relevant uh, is the current research focus which is around regional integration in Africa, then uh, peace and security, governance, development, um, science and technology also. And so we, for example, have undertaken what has been called a science diplomacy project, which we, where we engaged six universities across the continent to find out uh, their needs in relation to um, science and technology and you have the same things coming to the fore all the time. No access to funding, the need for collaboration, for example. Uh, how do we ensure uptake of the work? And, and so we're trying to strengthen those relationships in what has been now been called science diplomacy. Um, we also convene, more, uh, which would be relevant here, um, what is called the African Graduate Scholars Conference, where we bring masters and PhD students together on an annual basis to present the research that they have been doing, but also then to network with each other, um, along with other uh, platforms, because what, the, what ISA does, the Africa Institute for South Africa, is to bring researchers, policy makers, practitioners, together um, to deal with various issues facing the continent. Uh, we just did a quick scan of what ISIS produced between 2008 and 2019, because we couldn't go way back to, to 1960. And in terms of journal articles, it's been 491, occasional papers, 41, policy briefs, 250, and books, 162. But I think uh, we face challenges that a number of other remaining would face here. I'm going to conclude on this slide, which could be in relation to uh, lack of funding, a lack of human resources, because as you train scholars, uh, usually with re in research institutes, they are there on a contract basis. Scholars don't necessarily like that, and they keep leaving as well. So there's this continuous circulation. Uh, we face the challenge around if we're saying we're doing research to influence policy, how do you ensure the uptake of that particular research? This drive towards uh, producing quantity rather than quality, 
um, um, and policy relevant research rather than deep fundamental research. We also need to uh, pay particular focus on what is driving our research focus areas. How come we are being so reactive in what we are doing research on rather than having more proactive stance. And then I think uh, the need to reduce the competition within this research industry, if you can call it that, and the need for more collaboration, uh, the identification of knowledge gaps and new methodologies. Let me, let me stop there. Thank you, Cheryl um, and Heidi. Um, it's great to hear a little bit more about um, what, what you do. Um, please, if you have questions for them, write your name in the chat. Um, it, it seems, I thought it was interesting how, how you, Heidi, described that you move beyond open data and kind of look at impactful data and then kind of circling back to the conversations we've already had with incentives for also sharing your data. If, if you get it presented in a beautiful way or a way that, that you can also use. Um, then it kind of adds to that more, more sustainable data collection. So I thought that was very helpful to look at um, kind of data beyond open data. Uh, so, so thank you for sharing your uh, view on that. And I think Cheryl also did the challenges that you described for researchers um, also kind of connect the African reality to, to realities all over the world where so many researchers are on short-term contracts and you have to look for funding and, and instead of doing deeper research, uh, we kind of look from project to project and, and few projects, um, as Francois mentioned, are 10 year projects, but that's, that's very rare. Um, so let's see if we have any questions. I'm looking at the chat at the same time. Um, Lucy? Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, your work sounds really exciting and opening up is a great passion of mine. And I was just wondering if you knew of, are there other institutions who have data repositories like this or is what you're doing quite unique? Um, and have you ever considered expanding access so that maybe other institutions could publish their data on it? Um, and then a follow-up question, which is, what do you see as the role of this kind of data resource um, in terms of building up capacity on the continent for building up better research capacity on the continent? Sure. So thanks, thanks, Lucy. There were lots, lots of questions there. <laughs> you three in about five and a half, but I, so I'm going to try and just respond to, to what I can there. I think, yeah, increasingly uh, this field of Data curation is, is, is opening up and I think several uh, universities, several other research organizations in South Africa are, uh, are doing this. I think there's some challenges uh, around it. I mean, I think internally in our own organization and it's the challenges we have around the issue that you're talking about much more broadly in, in, in managing and collecting data uh, in universities. It's about how do we make data sexy, right? How do we get people to understand that organizing our data in these new usable interesting formats is a really important part of our work so for many of us work stops when we've got the data we publish it in these very particular kind of formats to very few publics very particular people and i think the big move is about how do we open that up but how do we also create much more interesting interest in the data both from the point of view of broader publics, how do we get people not just to look at dry back end of how you did the analysis, but also make it interesting. Um, so that, that's the stuff that's gonna encourage use and that's gonna in, going to encourage um, uptake. And I think it's a challenge for all of us. It's, it's a challenge about shifting our identities in terms of how we understand our role as researchers. Many of us don't have those skill sets. So how do we become skilled? And I think for Africa, that's a big issue. We need, we need to grow more people that are skilled, interested, fascinated, passionate about data and about transforming it and about visualizing it, about using it in ways uh, that can take us to those, those broader kind of end goals. So it's a big mindset shift as well as I think a bit of a skills deficit. We've got to grow that more, particularly now in this moment of just this moment we're in technological advancement for IR, we have to grow that more. And I think that's our big challenge. We are all still, may I say, old school, right? Old school in the way in which we think about research, data, and its use. And so it's moving us and shifting us into this new space of 
it's really a wonderful commodity that we, we could be uh, uh, using more purposefully. And <laughs> there's somebody, hello, next to you. Hello, how are you? My <laughs> yeah, so maybe just to end there. Okay, good. We have the next generation researchers with us as well. Yeah, she's, she's, she's taking you. up my point, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Right, th thank you for your wonderfully interesting presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed that focus on 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 uptake and on presentation of data, and, and as you said, making make, making data sexy. Uh, I had a question about the uptake of of um, research and what counts as uptake. How do you measure it? So, so Eric, thanks very much. That is the big question, right? How do we measure it? And so in the HSRC, we, we are new, the center's new. We've just started the center now in this last month, really. And I think those are the questions we want to be grappling with. Uh, much of the kind of uh, impact field and space and impact uh, uh, is around metrics, right? So how do you try and quantify these things? How do you try and begin to show uh, in very deliberate ways that the research you generated led to this particular outcome and that particular outcome and was taken up in these kinds of ways? And so I think we have to grapple more with that. Um, I think, uh, secondly, we are also trying to, from a humanities and perspective, saying that sometimes uptake or use of our research is much more softer than the quantitative metrics would allow. So we often have a sense the research I do or the work that I do makes a difference. And maybe there are other more qualitative ways of capturing that, uh, those narratives or those stories of change or that sense of the work I did fundamentally changed this particular community in this kind of way. So we're interested in trying to understand and develop these methodologies a bit more broadly. And I think ultimately where we'd like to go as HSRC is to begin to see these a combination of methodologies that allow us to tell a story of um, impact in the HSRC and how and how we get there. And I think just trying to address some of perhaps the limitations of the more quantitative ways of thinking about impact. Thank you, Heidi. I mean, telling a story of impact, that's, that's a nice way of, of putting it. I'm, I'm seeing now we have uh, one of the representatives from UNESCO with us and he's between meetings. So I'm gonna let him jump in now. Jusuf, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Yes, thank you. So Yusuf is working at the UNESCO Regional Office in Dakar, and he's the project coordinator for a quality assurance project. And I asked him to, to share what you do there. Quality assurance enhancement in, uh, in higher education in Africa. We can say that this project for quality assurance in higher education in Africa uh, was established to strengthen quality assurance in order to improve the to strengthen, to strengthen higher education system at the institutional uh, national and regional level in africa countries by developing quality assurance mechanism we was also implement uh, uh, complement unesco's effort to facilitate the internationalization of higher education and the implementation of this convention these projects have mainly three, uh, three components, three key key components, which are component one, to support the establishment of new quality assurance agency in five countries in Africa, Cote d'Ivoire, Mali, Niger, and Togo, by facilitating access to good practice, developing capacities, and supporting network with existing quality assurance agencies. The component two, is mainly focused on institutional capacity building of recently established quality assurance agency in five countries, which are Egypt, Gambia, Malawi, Namibia, Senegal, and Zambia, Zambia by reinforcing capacities of quality assurance professional, knowledge sharing, and the development of quality assurance tools. And then the component three of this project focused consolidating existing quality assurance network in Africa, including the African Quality Assurance Network, African, and the East 
African Quality Assurance Network for cross-fertilization of IDEA, sharing best practice and development of mutual recognition tool in quality assurance. For Dakar office, through the, this project, we have effectively support two, two countries to establish their national quality assurance agency, which are Mali and Niger. And for this project, we, we are also conducting study and survey on quality assurance in higher education. And we passed through, uh, for the method adopted for this project, we passed through the quality assurance agency established in diverse countries. And also we use the network for quality assurance agency established in Africa to make the survey we are conducting regularly. This is the, the method, the principal method used for this project to collect data on quality assurance. And the survey, what are the objective of the survey conducted in this project? Essentially, is to establish the level of networking of uh, the establish the level of networking in quality assurance in higher education in Africa and its impact to quality enhancement and harmonization of higher education in the continent to map out the role of quality assurance agencies in facilitating mutual recognition of qualification and on how higher education accreditation decision to contribute towards facilitating the mutual recognition arrangement to establish whether quality assurance system in Africa, in African countries, have made any impact in quality improvement in higher education in the continent, to obtain information to facilitating the development of strategies for collaborative engagement and networking in quality assurance in Africa, and developing and, and the development of tools for mutual recognition of quality qualification across the continent to establish best quality assurance practice for the first purpose of enhancing networking in quality assurance at regional and continental level in Africa. For Senegal, where I'm working, the main works have been done with ANACSUP, the Agence National of Quality, uh, Agence Nationale de l'Assurance Qualité de l'Enseignement Supérieur et de la Recherche, the National Agency of Quality Assurance in Higher Education and Research in Senegal. And also for West African, we use some established institution Two like minutes remaining. Uh, we voila, established institution like CAMES, the African Malagasy Council for Higher Education also. These are the main network and institution used for data collection and study we deal through this project. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Kasha. Thank you so much, uh, Yusuf, for, for letting us know where you are. So uh, from talking to your uh, colleague, Dr. Torsian, the other day, I understand also that you come at this quality assurance uh, project, also from a kind of a global uh, standpoint with, with um, kind of methodologies and, and indicators from a more global uh, level. Is that right? Yeah, we we are contact, uh, conducting a comparison, and so have been made uh, uh, with uh, regard to uh, indicator and best practice made at the great global level. Okay, thank you for that, and also thank you for on short notice coming to uh, replace Dr. Tochi, and I know that you uh, had not prepared for for being part of our uh, meeting as a presenter today. So I'm very, very grateful that you uh, stepped in on short notice. We appreciate you. Uh, 
Uh, we're going to move on to the last speaker before we go on break and then have our discussion. Um, <clears throat> last out is uh, Emeritus Professor at Tampere University, Seppo Helte, and he is, um, has a lot of experience from university management and has done research on that. And he's representing the organization SANUR here today. So Seppo, um, I'll give you uh, the floor. And I know we're running a few minutes late, but I'll, I'll give you more minutes for, we'll shift the break so that we get the 20 minutes break. So Seppo, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Kaiser, and uh, I really appreciate the invitation to take part of, of this panel. But uh, as uh, I, I have informed, I have quite a limited experience about Sanort. Actually, the, my university, Tampere University, has been very active in the activities of Sanort. But uh, personally, uh, I, I, I would say that I, I'm, I have been one of the beneficiaries of, of Sanort. This it just provided opportunities for. It's, uh, for academic cooperation for for me and my small unit called uh, higher education group uh, at the faculty, faculty of uh, management and business of Tampere University we are concentrated on research and uh, education in the field of higher education studies having the focus in in management leadership policy finance, uh, quality assurance, and so on. And um, I, I, uh, from that perspective, I, I, have my, I want to give some comments on the, the, uh, about, about the discussion this far. Uh, it is very evident that uh, the, the uh, data collection and getting uh, reliable and high quality data uh, for, for research institutional developments but also for the higher education policy making in Africa it is uh, an urgent issue and from my peer, uh, experience from Finland I know how much time and effort it will take and when we have entered to the European level it is it is still another other issue but uh, the expectations for universities are so huge nowadays also, also in African societies the demands have been growing quite rapid rapidly and uh, the, the universities and governments they have not been prepared to, to, for the communication of society by using reliable information which is urgently needed and in particular when we are talking about the global market economy and, uh, and the emergence of rankings we are and, uh, and the uh, global competition on students and, uh, uh, and, and stuff uh, we are now talking about uh, maybe one of the most urgent uh, issues related uh, higher education development in Africa but uh, but that, uh, but it has been very nice to hear about about uh, what the different organizations have done of course uh, UNESCO uh, but uh, but then the AAU uh, has done a very long term development work in the with the very limited resources in in, uh, in the in the area of data collection and uh, but uh, we can also see that uh, uh, we need a national and uh, african level data collection the basic data which is uh, which is needed but uh, then for, in particular the hirana project has been extremely uh, important to, to uh, as a kind of African pilot, I would say, uh, for the uh, for deepening the the underst understanding the comparative comparative aspect of African uh, African higher education and uh, and. Uh, what we have done in, in my unit is mainly, I would say that the priority has been, we have had two priorities. One is the 
is the human capacity building in the in the PhD program uh, in Tampere on higher education management, but also also the the we have we are running uh, and part of the master program on higher education. Uh, uh, research and in innovation in higher education, which is the one of the Erasmus Mundus master programs, and uh, this far we have had a, in, in the in the we have had uh, during these years maybe something like twenty five African master gr program graduates, and uh, and what I'm extremely proud of is the the. the uh, six PhD graduates who are uh, whom roles uh, one role what we can offer might be the res research capacity in the in the data collection who are the experts on higher education research. Now we this far we have a graduates from uh, Uganda, um, Cameroon. Uh, Ethiopia, uh, Ghana, but uh, but also some associate member of our PhD group, for instance, from South Africa, uh, and uh, and uh, and Egypt, meaning that uh, that is that that is uh, one perspective. To the data data collection, and but uh, what uh, we know that the demands are huge, but uh, we need to discuss also the focus and um, and the purpose of the improving the, the the data collection. So I think that's a very good transition to to our discussions that will follow the break. Thank you so much. Seth. Okay. Thank you.